going to get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to have you join us. Uh, this is our inaugural lecture of the Trends and Traditions Spring 2022 virtual lecture series that ICES is hosting um, through the whole spring semester and even into May um, and potentially even further if we go that far. Uh, the joy of all these lectures is that they'll be recorded and posted to YouTube after the fact. So even though you're all here to join us, the people who will watch us on YouTube later will hear that and know that all these videos coming up um, will be made for uh, made available for you to view after the fact. Um, just so everyone is aware, I am recording this. Um, so if you say something, uh, if you ask a question and it appears later and we do answer it, it will appear. So just keep that in mind um, in case you have any doubts about that. Um, Josh will speak and then we're going to open this up to a Q&A. There's a Q&A box down on the lower right hand side or right hand part of your screen for the Zoom window. Um, please use that box later in the talk to uh, pose your questions. Um, I will be reading them um, and moderating that section as well. Um, so this morning I'm very excited to introduce Joshua Yaffa who is um, a journalist and author, journalist at the New Yorker um, and author of Between Two Fires, which I still only have the hard copy, but um, I definitely recommend checking that out if you have time. There is a, um, a soft cover as well that um, is something to check out for you. Um, so Josh is joining us this morning um, in Kiev. So he actually is not in Moscow. So we're getting an update um, from the neighbor um, over in the region of Europe that we are very much looking at these days in the US. Um, so Josh Yaf is a journalist based in Moscow, Russia. Today he's in Kiev. He's a contributor to The New Yorker and has also written for The Economist, The New York Times, Bloomberg Business Week, Foreign Affairs, The, Amer uh, the New Republic, and other publications. For his work in Russia, he has received fellowships from the American Academy in Berlin, New America, and the McDowell Colony. He has also been a finalist for a Livingston Award, a visiting scholar at the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, and um, as an associate editor at uh, Foreign, or sorry, and received a grant for the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting. Prior to moving to Moscow, he worked as an associate editor at Foreign Affairs. He's also taught magazine writing at um, the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and he's originally from San Diego. So good morning, Josh, please, um, I'll let you take it away. Thanks very much for the um, generous introduction, Zach, and I'm glad to be with you all today. Uh, as Zach mentioned, I am in Kiev. Uh, I came here two days ago to try and get a sense of what this very tense moment looks like uh, from Ukraine. Ukraine is in the awkward and unfortunate position of, of being uh, the uh, participant in this in this crisis that in a sense kind of has a metaphorical knife to its throat but at the same time doesn't have a lot of um, agency or ability in, in in how that knife is is wielded and, and, and if it's wielded um, this is really and it's in the bigger picture sense a strategic conflict between the United States and Russia an attempt really by Russia to relitigate the outcome and settlement of the uh, post-Cold War period. And we'll talk a bit about that and, and, and what Russia is, is hoping to achieve and, and why. But um, the end result is you have a situation in which Kiev is, or in Ukraine more broadly, is in this position of, of bracing and um, with anticipatory anxiety for a potential large-scale Russian invasion, but, but can't really put its finger on the scale to determine whether or not that invasion will happen. That's a, a big geopolitical game that's being waged first and foremost between Russia and the United States and really I think by Russia itself. This is a kind of single actor story, a rare case of that type when the ultimate decision for whether or not there will be war I think really rests with one, uh, one man, that is to say Vladimir Putin. Um, and we're all, not just in, in Kiev, but here I would say even in Washington or Berkeley or wherever, waiting to see what Putin um, decides. And that's a, a, a strange and, and I think for many kind of frustrating position to be in, but I think that is nonetheless where we are. Um, that said, let me, let me take a few steps back. I, I sort of sped through my own understanding of the conflict to get to where we are right now without going back to the beginning, at least as I see it. And the beginning really is um, not even 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, but 1989, uh, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, where really when the Soviet empire began to crumble uh, with that event, with the loss of the Eastern European satellites, that is really when the, um, the end of the empire began and, and the unraveling of Soviet power began. And, and 
events that date back to that period are what Putin um, is trying to undo, or, or rather, uh, he's not only trying to undo the post-91 settlement, but in a way, I would argue the post-89 settlement, settlement when the unification of Germany paved the way for the first expansion of NATO into East Germany, and then the ball was rolling from there um, uh, with NATO being poised to take on countries in Eastern Europe and um, the Baltics. I was told something very interesting by a uh, Russian analyst in, in Moscow at the Carnegie Center here, uh, Alexander Balnov, who told me that after 20 years, or at this point, 22 years in power, Putin sees himself as the um, responsible figure for determining the final outcome of the post-Cold War settlement, or at least Russia's place in the post-Cold post -Cold War settlement. In other words, given his own longevity, Putin tells himself that why should Gorbachev, who was in power for much less than me, Yeltsin, who was in power for much less than me, why should their decisions, or as Putin thinks, I'm quite certain, mistakes, be determinative in setting uh, the long-term nature of Russian power, Russia's role in Europe, Russia's role in Western security architecture. Uh, here I am for 22 years. This is my responsibility and in a way my historical role to right the wrongs of um, Gorbachev and Yeltsin, uh, specifically as concerns uh, NATO expansion, which has always been uh, among the more sensitive and sore topics for Russia, which uh, sees NATO as an inherently uh, anti-Russian uh, military structure. And also, despite NATO's claims to being purely defensive, points, understandably, or rather just with undeniable kind of facticity, to operations in Kosovo, uh, in Afghanistan, and in Libya, to note that, in fact, NATO operates um, more than it does uh, defensively inside the borders of NATO countries. It operates, uh, in fact, um, outside of uh, NATO's borders. So there, there's lots of reasons, both, I think, imagined, uh, but also potentially with, with some understandable factual grounding for why successive Russian leaders have been so obsessed about this NATO question, but Sir Putin certainly um, is and, he, and uh, believes that Russia's interests were not served by the decisions of Gorbachev, who allowed, um, without much uh, foresight or with um, essentially allowed himself to be rolled over, uh, as I think Putin and other hardliners see it, by the West in the final years of the Soviet Union. And then Yeltsin, who presided over a country that was simply too weak, too poor, or too chaotic to do anything about NATO uh, expansion. Although as uh, the wonderful historian, uh, Mary Elise Surratt pointed out in a book, Not One Inch, that I, I highly recommend, and, and I wrote a piece about this book and interviewed um, Professor Surratt for my own uh, art article in The New Yorker, she wisely points out among many other interesting and important factual and historical tidbits concerning NATO expansion, that if in the wake of the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the reunification of Germany, uh, NATO, or rather the, the West needed Soviet, therefore Gorbachev's uh, approval because the Soviet Union as one of the victor nations of World War II, uh, as well as having hundreds of thousands of soldiers in East Germany, uh, Soviet Union had a kind of veto over the nature of West German reunification and therefore the question of NATO expansion. And so the West had to get Gorbachev's buy-in. Uh, by the time we get to Yeltsin, and we're talking about expansion into Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary. Uh, 90s Russia doesn't really have the ability to stop NATO expansion um, if it doesn't like it. And it doesn't. It doesn't have that ability. And, and, and Yeltsin, uh, again, you know, playing a weak hand, wasn't able to um, really do anything but uh, uh, protest and, and act in all sorts of contradictory ways at, at various points saying he didn't, he wasn't opposed to NATO expansion and then um, later agreeing to it. So uh, I'm telling this uh, story in a, in a certainly rushed way, but I hope the point emerges, which is that uh, this history doesn't feel um, obvious or um, uh, inevitable uh, to Putin. In other words, it's, uh, he doesn't believe that the history of NATO expansion and the way that security architecture emerged in Europe in the wake of the Cold War to be somehow an organic, natural, inevitable state of affairs. He thinks that that's the state of affairs that was forced on Russia in a period of weakness when it was led by 
uh, leaders who could not do anything to counteract or overcome that weakness. And now here he is with this chance um, to do something about it as he sees. And I think that, um, you know, however, we, we can have our own kind of qualitative um, assessments of this and, and should, but I think we should understand that Putin himself sees himself in his kind of late stage legacy phase of his presidency. You know, I don't know if he's actually looking toward the exits and he won't run again in 2024, but that's entirely possible. But um, he seems to be concerned with uh, preparing his historical legacy. And as he sees it, um, I I'm convinced that Putin himself is, believes he's acting earnestly in Russia's best security interests. He thinks that he needs to bequeath Russia, uh, a Russia that has a more um, secure, uh, and um, prime place in Europe's security architecture, not threatened uh, by NATO. Um, not just the presence of, of NATO in terms of what states are members of NATO, but also where that NATO military infrastructure is placed. And I say that distinction because when we get to the question of Ukraine, I think it's important to understand that Russia is afraid not only of formal NATO membership for Ukraine, but also a kind of backdoor de facto membership in which NATO member countries, whether it's Turkey that supplies drones, the United States that supplies anti-tank uh, missiles, or the UK that is now also shipping um, a large number of military uh, weaponry to Ukraine, that if enough NATO weapons appear in Ukraine, then and those weapons are uh, advanced enough, then you'll need NATO soldiers to uh, operate or train, rather, um, Ukrainian soldiers in those weapons. And then if you have NATO weaponry and NATO troops in Ukraine, is that essentially akin to membership, um, even if there isn't uh, a formal membership plan in progress? So with Putin worried about all of that, looking toward his own historical legacy, as Baunov told me, thinking that it's his role and his right to set the historical record straight, uh, as it were, and also looking across the ocean and seeing Biden, I believe, and it have been told by many analysts and people uh, in the foreign policy world in Moscow, that Putin, it's not that he thinks Biden is weak um, or distracted or can be manipulated. I think the story of Afghanistan is, is really telling. I think there's an idea that Putin looked at the American withdrawal of Afghanistan and saw a country that was weak in disarray, that fled, leaving behind you know, really awful scenes uh, of, of chaos and violence. And it was a real low point of American power. Um, there may be an element to that, or there certainly is an element to that, whether or not Putin uh, sees it as such. The, the, the scenes were indeed discouraging, if not humiliating. But uh, from what I understand, Putin took a different lesson from that, which is that if Biden uh, sees uh, an important kind of long-term strategic imperative for the United States, in other words, um, the U.S. should ent should leave the war in Afghanistan after uh, 20 years, it is time for the United States to enter that conflict, that he will uh, embark on these sorts of foreign policy measures, even if they uh, look uh, they look bad, they create a bad kind of political context or environment um, for Biden, even if they, in the short term, call American power into question. If Biden believes that a sort of difficult and not very politically advantageous move is nonetheless in U.S. interest, then he's willing to uh, to see it through. And I think Putin saw that and, and hoped that uh, he could forge some sort of pragmatic solution with Biden, not just regarding Ukraine, but regarding uh, the greater post-Cold War settlement. That may have been a grave miscalculation. We'll, we'll, we can talk about that and we'll see. I, we, Putin may have really mistaken Biden's calculus in Ukraine, or excuse me, Biden's calculus in Afghanistan and presumed he would be willing to make some sort of similar pragmatic, even politically costly compromise um, in Ukraine, but that may not at all um, be the case. And we're seeing, in fact, the Biden administration take a rather hard line uh, with Russia and doesn't seem to be all that willing to make um, meaningful compromises um, to Russia's demands, which have been laid out pretty um, clearly, uh, which is no further uh, NATO uh, expansion, the withdrawal, or the uh, no deployment of missiles that could reach um, Russia uh, near Russia's borders, and the withdrawal of military infrastructure from NATO countries that joined after 1997. That's a pretty um, 
ambitious list. There's a lot of chutzpah in, in putting forward such uh, proposals. Um, I don't think the odds of them being uh, approved or met uh, were ever all that high or anything really much above zero. Um, and presumably the, quest, the Kremlin knew that. And, and this, ri this raises the question, uh, gets us to the really kind of acute question of the day, which is what is Russia doing? What are these 130,000 troops doing um, on Ukraine's border? Now with the influx of uh, 20,000 or so troops to Belarus, Ukraine is surrounded on three sides by Russian troops. Um, and everyone is asking the question, why and what does Russia plan to do with those troops? Are they there to create um, conditions to essentially frighten both Ukraine and the West to make concessions on those points that I just raised on these formal, this formal wish list that Russia has presented to the West? Is it uh, are the troops meant to you know, make the West realize the um, severity of the threat and the severity of the moment and, and agree to make concessions that it otherwise wouldn't. I, I've heard that uh, opinion repeatedly from people I trust close to um, kind of foreign policy elite or members of the foreign policy elite in um, Moscow. As, as one of them told me, Fyodor uh, Lukyanov, a, a wonderfully uh, informed and astute observer of, of foreign policy and editor of a uh, magazine or journal, Russia and Global Affairs, uh, told me, com compare this moment or, or the run up to this moment to what happened to breakthroughs in, in psychoanalysis, however uh, awkward or funny that analogy seems. But he said that the patient needed to be knocked out of his comfort zone. In other words, referring to the West and the United States and specifically that for many, many years, Russia would raise similar complaints to the, uh, or similar demands to those that has now again put to the West. And it was all too easy for the United States and the West more broadly to laugh those demands off to say, yeah, not right now, or yeah, maybe we'll get to those later, or yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Um, and Russia, understanding this, came to believe that the only way to force uh, a conversation on the issues that mattered to it were to create an uncomfortable and um, anxiety-inducing uh, situation uh, for the West. And in that sense, you could say, at least so far, um, it has worked. That's the, that's the opinion of someone like uh, Lukyanov, who says that, look at the results, you know, the United States is now talking about things that it used to laugh Russia out of the room uh, for wanting to, to talk about. It's now having conversations about security in Europe that it never found the time or interest um, to have uh, before. The question is, are those conversations enough to actually stave off war? Should, you know, the United States be prioritizing, in fact, the kinds of compromises that could satisfy Russia? Is there anything that could satisfy Russia? Those are the really important and unfortunately, um, unsolved and maybe un un unknowable, unsolvable questions uh, we have um, before us. Clearly, the United States, um, NATO is not going to renounce um, the memorandum it released in 2008 when it said that Georgia and Ukraine would eventually become NATO members. I don't think that under the barrel of a gun, the United States is going to walk back um, its commitments or, or, or sort of let Russia dictate the terms of who or who cannot join um, NATO. I think the United States is ready to talk about more technical issues, say the placement of missiles in Europe, the placement of conventional forces in Europe, the carrying out of military exercises, both by Russia and by the United States. Um, those are areas where it seems like the US is willing to talk, but will that satisfy this big strategic aim and, and urge that Putin has going back to this notion of fixing the injustices as he sees them of uh, the post uh, Cold War settlement. Is there anything the West can realistically offer that would satisfy Putin? And, and here I've gotten mixed um, responses. I've gotten responses like that from Lukyanov that says, look, the, the process we're, we're in right now is already proof that Russia is getting something. It's already proof that Russia has been able to force conversations about things um, that it wasn't previously able uh, to get the West to take it seriously um, about. And that, and that now we're entering into the phase when essentially things get serious. That's the opinion of someone like Lukyanov. Now, now the conversation has started. Now the real game begins. Everything up until now has been a kind of throat clearing to prepare for the real diplomatic game um, to come. That is one uh, uh, option, which I think is entirely credible. 
um, we can sort of sum up this school as saying, uh, the school of thought as saying that the troop surge um, was not about invasion, but was it about uh, forcing a conversation. And now that conversation um, has begun. Of course, there is another school of thought, which is uh, essentially, you know, uh, you, you should believe what your eyes and ears are telling you, that there's no reason to come up with complicated theories um, about what's happening here when what has been happening here is Russia has been steadily building up the necessary forces, not just ground, but air, naval, amphibious, um, for a sustained assault uh, on Ukraine for months. And, and that is what is going to happen in the near future. Um, the evidence pointing in, in that direction is essentially what else could satisfy Russia, or rather seeing as how almost no points from its major strategic wish list are likely to be uh, met. Russia is already bearing the costs of this military buildup in terms of um, solidarity uh, in Europe. If, Russia has, if Russia's strategic goal is to split European solidarity, we're now seeing at least uh, sort of NATO um, solidarity. Uh, we're seeing increased shipments of arms to Ukraine, the very thing that made Russia uh, nervous uh, and, and upset um, in, in the first place. And you're seeing a uh, renewed talk of uh, unprecedented sanctions uh, in the United States uh, and the UK first uh, and foremost. So uh, not to mention the hit that this has taken on uh, the Russian ruble uh, placed Nord Stream 2 uh, under threat. So there's a lot of costs that Russia is paying or, or, or could be paying um, for this operation that hasn't even really begun yet, right? We're just talking about the buildup. So if Russia were to um, sort of walk away, not being satisfied on its major points, what was all this about? What was the point? Why did Russia embark on this costly endeavor to not get much in return? That is what makes um, some analysts pessimistic. And that is what also can make me pessimistic in, in moments where I uh, when I think about that kind of logic, I get pessimistic about the prospects of war. When I think about the previous logic, uh, I, I calm down a bit, but the truth is that I go back and forth by the day as to you know, what the likely outcome is here. Um, I'll finish my opening remarks talking about the perspective in, in Ukraine. I've only been on the ground here for a couple of days, uh, though I've certainly been talking to contacts and, and colleagues here throughout. Um, but I'll give a bit of a sense of, of what the mood is here. Certainly uh, calm. You don't get the sense, at least in, in Kiev, where I've been so far of a nation preparing for mass uh, invasion. People definitely are going about um, their lives. That seems to be the mission, or rather the message delivered by President uh, Zelensky, who at various points seems has, veer, has veered even to the, uh, into territory of kind of denying the obvious, denying uh, nonetheless that the threat is real and does exist to try and prevent uh, panic and maintain uh, calm. But the calm does seem to be, or normalcy rather, at least seems to be the order of the day here in Kiev, um, there is some anxiety, and I think justifiable, about whether or not the uh, sort of the cost of peace with Russia will be borne by Ukraine. In other words, um, if the West isn't able to come up with answers or formulations or concessions that would satisfy Russia on these big questions concerning the post Cold War settlement, um, you know, are there mechanisms which with which Russia could be satisfied with at least um, the state of things in Ukraine and in the Donbass region. For example, we've seen the reactivization of the Minsk uh, process, the so-called Normandy format in which Russia, Ukraine, France, and Germany discuss a potential political settlement to the war in Donbass. The Minsk uh, agreements, which were signed in 2015 at a moment of really desperate battlefield weakness for Ukraine when Russian normal regular armed forces that intervened on the side of the uh, would-be separatist forces uh, and, and Ukrainian military was really on the verge of destruction, uh, it was forced to sign these agreements, which if implemented as Russia um, interprets uh, the sort of letter of the law to suggest, um, Ukrainian politics would have uh, a kind of veto or rather that the separatist regions reincorporated into Ukraine would retain a kind of veto over Ukraine's strategic orientation on questions like uh, joining NATO and so on. That in, in essence would mean that Russia gains a kind of foothold or veto over strategic uh, questions of strategic policy in Ukraine, which is why Ukraine 
many politicians in Kiev, including Zelensky, I believe, and, and those close to him find that Minsk is, would be difficult, if not impossible, to implement, at least in its current form. But if Ukraine's arm was twisted by the West into um, implementing uh, Minsk, could that satisfy Russia and thus stave off war? You know, maybe that's, um, that's an interesting idea, or rather it's an open question. Could Russia be satisfied with a form of Minsk agreements in which Ukraine is essentially hobbled or Ukrainian sovereignty is hobbled in a way that would be advantageous um, to Russia? Maybe Moscow would be satisfied with that. The, but the problem is um, Ukraine uh, is actually a vibrant pluralistic um, uh, democracy. Uh, and that even if Zelensky himself felt like he had no choice but to implement Minsk to, so as to stave off a major invasion, it's not clear that the, UMA, the Ukrainian public um, would go for such uh, a compromise. Uh, in previous rounds of Minsk talks in 2019, there were large protests in Kiev against Zelensky making any concessions or really talking to Russia um, at all. Uh, with, although he hasn't announced it, I think it's um, essentially an open secret in Kiev that Zelensky will indeed run for a second term. Uh, and it could be politically um, deadly for him to be seen to making um, concessions to Russia or really engaging in any sort of dialogue with Russia at all. So this Minsk process, though it could potentially seem attractive as a way of staving off war, um, I don't think um, is, is all that seems politically viable uh, in Ukraine, uh, and Ukrainians point not just to their to the own domestic um, kind of disagreement or their own domestic you know, protest that such a deal would likely engender, but they but they point to the long term danger of Ukraine uh, acceding or rather following the Minsk agreements as Russia sees them, and that if Russia were to gain this strategic uh, veto over Ukrainian um, orientation through the separatist areas that would only make things like security cooperation all the more difficult in the future. In other words, the kinds of uh, military equipment and arms that Ukraine is currently getting from NATO members, might not, Ukraine might not be able to receive that in the future, right? Were these um, separatist areas incorporated into Ukraine and, and given this um, effective veto that was, would essentially mean a Russian veto. So there's a lot of wariness for a number of reasons around um, the Minsk agreement specifically, but I think more broadly, this wariness in Ukraine of the idea that um, the West, or as one um, interlocutor here put it, I think this is the, the most pithy way of, of describing it, and I'll close my opening remarks by saying what could look like the diplomatic off-ramp uh, to the West in its crisis with Russia could essentially function as a kind of uh, political on-ramp to unrest and um, great turmoil in Ukraine itself. Um, so with that, um, uh, I'll say thank you for, for your attention, and we'll be happy to answer questions and engage in whatever discussion is of interest to you. Thank you, Josh. Um, that was, oh, oh, okay, I'm on. Thank you, Josh. Uh, that was great. Um, so if, if you do have questions, please, um, if you could pose them in the Q&A box, I will then read them to Josh, and he will answer them. Um, to give you a little bit of time to propose questions, I'm going to ask one in the meantime. Um, Josh, for most of my life, as in basically all of it that I've been um, cognizant, the Soviet Union hasn't exist. The Cold War has been done in a sense. Do you see this as a new conflict? And by new, I just mean a new approach, a new uh, emphasis, so to speak. Or is this kind of a Cold War relic, like rearing its head for the last time um, with Putin being in his position? I see it as a, a mix of the two. I see the causes of this um, current standoff and potential war is very much an echo of the slow motion collapse of the Soviet Union and, and the slow motion um, end of the Cold War. You know, empires don't actually collapse overnight. It's, it's a process. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's a number of historians who, who can speak to this with much greater um, you know, precision um, than, than I can. But, you know, these are, these are processes. They are not events that, that happen in a single night and then finish. And I think that the, what we're seeing is a kind of post-imperial revenge, revanche uh, on Putin's um, part to, to kind of rebel uh, against the way that that um, uh, it, it kind of post-imperial story seemed to end, but, but it, it hasn't really ended, right? It's, it's Putin trying to end it uh, on his own terms. It's believing that this is not settled history but rather history that's still in play. And that gets to this idea that was 
told to me by um, Sasha uh, Balnov, who, who said that you know Putin believes that it's his right to determine the final settlement of the post Cold War you know security architecture that wasn't Gorbachev's right, it wasn't Yeltsin's right. Like it's his chance to do so. That said, the part that makes this a, a kind of very of the moment conflict is, is the means with which it's um, waged, right? It is very much a 21st century conflict. I actually don't think I should have said this in my opening remarks. I think the most likely scenario, even in the case of um, a Russian um, invasion, is not you know, tanks rolling across the frozen marshes of northern or eastern Ukraine, right? I think we're going to see something much more um, uh, technologically um, uh, driven, right? We could see that I think the cyber element could be key, um, very postmodern. I think information or disinformation options, operations um, could be central here. You know, this was, there is this strange and in some ways in its presentation um, kind of risable uh, story about this um, false flag video that Russia was planning that the Biden administration um, kind of preempted or, or, or claimed to preempt. Uh, a lot of m missing details in that story, but you know, fits certainly historically, at least with um, Russian disinformation um, operations. So I, I don't think we're going to see necessarily. I, I mean, I, I hope we're not going to see for for, I have for, for human humanistic reasons, but also for analytical um, ones. I don't think we're going to see a sort of you know uh, tank and trench battle in Europe. I think we're going to the nature of the conflict. I think could be much more modern or even um, uh, postmodern in the way it's actually executed. Thank you. Um, so we have a question. Uh, what exactly is Putin afraid of from NATO? Does he think NATO will invade Russia? That's absurd. NATO is just a defensive body. What if you could maybe expand a little more on NATO and Putin's relationship with it? Sure. Um, I think the, the, the answer to this it requires us to sort of suspend our own. Um, it, it requires us to kind of just take Putin at his word, even if it seems objectively or analytically incorrect to us. I think Putin is being genuine when he talks about NATO being a threat um, to Russia. You know, however much NATO countries themselves are sure that, of course, NATO is never going to invade Russia. And I believe that's obviously true. NATO is not going to wake up one day and invade Russia. Nonetheless, um, Putin sees NATO um, both historically and in its current moment as being an inherently anti-Russian alliance meant, if not to invade Russia, then at least to contain um, Russian power, right? And uh, that actually, in a way, we can argue about, you know, that, well, yes, of course it's meant to contain Russian power because look at what Russia's doing, uh, right? So here you get into a kind of chicken and egg problem where it's unclear where, what's the, um, you know, what's cause and what's effect. Uh, Putin is his own worst enemy. I mean, look what's happening right now. This whole military buildup. Putin was afraid um, or, or, or um, sort of saw a threat in the fact that certain NATO countries were arming Ukraine with NATO military equipment. Like I mentioned, the Turkish drones, the US javelins. Well, what did he do? Being upset about that, he uh, uh, surged, you know, Russian troops to the border with Ukraine and into Belarus, flooded the, the border with uh, enough troops that made uh, the West and Ukraine justifiably concerned about a large-scale Russian invasion, thus prompting NATO member states to send even more uh, military equipment and arms to Ukraine, making his own, making the initial problem all that much worse. So I think there actually is a lot of um, overblown talk of Putin as being this kind of, you know, grand uh, chess playing geo strategic genius. Um, I, I, I think he he can sort of outmaneuver tactically um, the West, which is just sort of more hide bound by things like, you know, both democratic polities and um, democratic values. And, and, and that sometimes makes it um, a bit, you know, uh, lumbering, um, but in ways that we should be uh, grateful for uh, compared to Putin, who can sometimes act more kind of nimbly and, and certainly cynically. But nonetheless, I think we, we give him a bit too much credit for being some sort of um, chessboard um, genius when, when in, in this case, he seems to be um, acting on an initial fear. He's, he's only making um, the, that, that, that fear, you know, kind of become all the more um, uh, looming and, and all the more um, uh, large. I also mentioned this sort of one more point on, on NATO. I mentioned this in my opening remarks. If you look at it from Russia's perspective, you know, where has NATO actually operated? Um, you know, NATO has only in, uh, invoked Article 5 once in its history, and it didn't do so 
uh, or rather the, the having it, uh, um, invoked Article 5, it didn't send troops to defend a NATO member state, it sent troops to Afghanistan. Um, you know, outside of NATO's um, geographic border. So the one time NATO operated in collective defense, it didn't actually do so on the territory of NATO member states. And other times NATO has operated, for example, in Kosovo or Libya, it's done so completely out of its borders, not at all defending a NATO state. I, I, that's not to say that NATO, you know, should not have embarked on the mission in Kosovo or Libya. That's a separate kind of debate that we can, we can have about the, um, the pluses and minuses of those missions and their impact and, and, and so on. But from Russia's perspective, um, it becomes difficult to believe this idea of NATO being a purely defensive alliance when if we look at the its recent uh, the kind of test cases of when it's actually used force, when NATO member states acting in the name of NATO have, have used military force, it's been um, really exclusively outside the borders uh, of NATO member states. and, and um, uh, Again, we can call this um, sort of foolish, unrealistic, hysterical thinking, but I think it's genuine um, in Moscow, at least in Putin's mind and in the minds of those around him, that you know, if NATO can act in Kosovo or Libya, you know, what's stopping it from acting? Okay, maybe not um, in you know Russia, but but Belarus or, or you know sort of other areas of great um, strategic interest to um, Russia. So I think there really is. The, the, the two sides are really talking past each other. No, the, the West and Western leaders are very earnest and very certain and really mean it when they say that NATO is a defensive alliance. How could this possibly threaten you? And Putin and uh, other top Russian officials genuinely mean it when they say, what are you talking about? Look at how obviously um, this alliance um, threatens our interests. Thank you. Um, this is a longer one. You might want to check the Q&A box as well. Uh, here's an alternative to either NATO membership or conceding Ukraine to the Russian sphere of influence. Formal neutralization of Ukraine, a la Austria, 1955, plus the implementation of the Minsk Accords minus the security veto, no longer needed if formal neutralization. The US, Russia, and France, and Germany would have to impose this on Ukraine, which could sober up radicals within Ukraine who prefer NATO membership. I assume that Moscow would welcome this solution. What is your reaction? Um, it's an interesting kind of idea that, that um, hard for me to sort of prognosticate on, um, you know, how that would go down in, in respective capitals, right? We sort of assume the question, the questioner is, is I think right to suggest that would likely satisfy Moscow, but do we really, um, you know, do we really know that, right? There's a, um, there's certainly a fear in Ukraine that I've picked up on in the past few days that like the, the appetite grows with the eating, right? If you sort of uh, give Moscow under the um, threat of 130,000 troops, if you give Moscow what it wants now, that's, you know, Moscow is not going to sort of stay sated um, uh, forever. And also this notion of neutrality could be tricky, that that also could be in the eye of the beholder in the years going forward. In other words, sort of what that means, I think could be, would be contested from day one and would just be, would remain a contentious, perhaps explosively so um, aspect of Ukrainian politics going forward. Look at what's happened with the Minsk Accords. Um, neither side can agree what those agreements um, even mean or, or sort of demand of, of both parties. Both sides say they're willing to abide by the Minsk agreements, but the issue is that, you know, neither side or both sides have a different understanding of what the um, that actually means. And I think the same thing could be true here. Um, the most, kind of, the, 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 I don't want to say problematic, but the, the issue that um, makes that scenario the most difficult is the Ukrainian political one. In other words, you know, as I said in my opening remarks, this is a country with um, vibrant, dynamic, uh, really clashing uh, politics. Um, and I think that there is an element, of course, of Zelensky using the, the following to, um, to his own kind of political expediency. In other words, when, when he says, if you, you know, force me to implement Minsk like the Russians want, or you force me to make other concessions, I'm going to have a civil war in my hands. You know, you're going to, you think the situation is bad now, if you really force me to go for these concessions, the country's going to blow up and, you know, not just I'm going to be in a much worse place, but, but everyone's going to be in a much worse place. Um, in a way that's kind of convenient for him to say, right? It, it, it kind of allows him uh, or, or provides the argumentative basis for the, uh, to, to not go for certain concessions that, that he doesn't want to go for. 
But I think there's an element of truth to that. I mean, I don't think that's an entirely unfeasible or unrealistic um, scenario. And I don't think that Zelensky can cut a deal with the West and Russia over the head of the Ukrainian people, right? I think we, we sometimes find ourselves talking about these issues as if Zelensky can just, you know, fine, throw up his hands and say, fine, you know, for the sake of kind of staving off war, I'll agree to do X, Y, and Z. But if X, Y, and Z is, is not um, acceptable for Ukrainian society, for Ukrainian voters, um, then, you know, we've got a real crisis on our hands. And, and, and how much, you know, how can that agreement then be implemented? I mean, there's talk even um, around Minsk, which is an actual kind of ongoing diplomatic process, right? The questioner asks this intriguing and, 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 and perhaps not entirely unreasonable or unrealistic, you know, hypothetical scenario. But we have an actual ongoing real diplomatic process, the Minsk agreements that you know, um, are already happening. And there's a lot of doubt in Ukraine about even if Zelensky was able to forge a compromise there in this existing process, would Ukraine's parliament actually approve it? He could have a problem, for example, you know, not all that dissimilar to the one Obama faced with the Iran deal, like a president can reach a grand diplomatic bargain, but if um, legislature doesn't approve it, well, like, you're kind of back to square one. And, and, and that is the situation. For better or worse, Ukraine has a really um, sort of vibrant, boisterous, pluralistic um, democracy. Um, so for, for those, just in, in quick summation, for those two reasons, for one, not being wanting to seem to be appeasing Russia because appeasement um, potentially, right, is, is never the end of the story, but rather the beginning and of, of these domestic political concerns. I just don't know how realistic um, that scenario is. Thank you. Um... So we have another question. Um, how do the people of Ukraine generally assess Putin's invasion of Crimea? And why is that even not evidence for his ability and willingness to continue with another invasion? Um, Crimea is, is certainly a sore point among many Ukrainians. I mean, it's hard to talk about um, kind of Ukrainian public opinion um, writ large, right? There's a lot of, when, when I, to, see my answer to the previous question when I talk about um, a really kind of boisterous um, uh, plurality of views here. Um, so I, I want to sort of emphasize that first and foremost. So it's difficult to talk about, you know, what is the Ukrainian attitude to Crimea? Well, there's, you know, lots of Ukrainian attitudes toward um, Crimea. Um, I mean, you do get a sense from Zelensky administration and other officials involved in foreign policy that, that they are that they concede it's necessary to separate out Donbass from Crimea. In other words, uh, there can be negotiations about the settlement of the Donbass conflict that don't involve settlement of the Crimea issue and, and Ukraine's um, you know, insistence on, at, at some point, having talks about the status of Crimea, returning Crimea to Ukraine, seeing it um, you know, is considered not just here, but internationally as an illegal annexation. Um, as to the, you know, but, but I think that there's a kind of willingness and understanding that this the moment, the, this moment um, of real crisis, or at least of potential for wide scale conflict, calls for a certain pragmatism in which the Crimea issue is tabled for a later date. Um, as for Crimea serving a kind of precedent or, or proof of what Putin is capable of, here I think it's not so much about. Um, Putin's intentions or, or willingness, but about capabilities and that Crimea was and, and remains, I think, a really unique situation in the way that Russia was able to annex Crimea without a shot fired um, is, was specific both to that in post Maidan, immediate post Maidan moment um, of early 2014, of, of, of total collapse of the Ukrainian armed forces, total disorientation of the country's um, political uh, kind of uh, class um, with a real vacuum in, in Kiev, but also historically the nature of um, politics and culture in Crimea itself, which, which was kind of Russian oriented in a way that even the Donbass um, wasn't and, and viewed itself as having historical ties, cultural, political, and otherwise to Russia that again, even um, the more pro-Russian or Russian oriented parts of Donbass didn't to that extent. So there was a, a, a number of factors that came together that allowed Putin a you know, annexation on the cheap, in other words. And I just don't think that's a repeatable 
um, event. It, it turned out not to be repeatable in Donbass, um, which uh, rather than being a kind of cheap and easy annexation turned into a, a grinding war that continues to this day and certainly wouldn't be the case if Russian um, you know, tanks or soldiers or, were to stream across the border. Uh, uh, again, um, it's, it's clear that I mean, it, it, it could, the, the human toll of such a conflict would be um, horrific, but uh, you know, Russia would also suffer its own, own losses in such a conflict and it would not be, I don't think anything like the sort of operation we saw uh, in Crimea. Thank you. Um, President, so here's another question. President Biden recently stated that he would make sure that there is no Nord Stream 2 project happening if Russia invades Ukraine. Do you believe he's telling the truth, considering the importance this project has for Germany, as well as the fact that Chancellor Schultz has avoided any statement concerning this? It does seem like there's a lot of momentum for pretty severe sanctions in Congress, not just in the White House, if Russia were to invade. And um, again, talking about the kind of separation of powers and that even presidents you know, don't decide everything, right? I can imagine a scenario in which Congress passes really aggressive um, sanctions in the wake of a, a future invasion that could, in fact, you know, hamstring um, or, or sort of make effectively impossible Nord Stream 2, right? I mean, Nord Stream 2 is like a Russian-German project. So what role does the U.S. have here? But of course, the U.S. through the sanctions mechanism can, can make um, the participation of, of German companies um, all but impossible. Uh, in, in the pipeline, Can, the U.S. could you know, effectively kill it, um, if not sort of formally, legally. Um, and it seems like there's a seriousness of intent and purpose around that um, in, in Washington. But I think you know, Biden's kind of Freudian slip had some truth to it when he talked about you know, minor incursions versus invasions. And I think Putin, I don't think Putin um, needed Biden to say that to understand such a you know moment was at play. I think Putin knew full well that if he took a, a nibble of Ukraine, right? If he if he, for example, as Russian Parliament is set to debate on Friday, recognize the would-be breakaway republics in Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, recognize their independence, maybe then incorporate them into Russia, or at least draw them into a closer formal cooperation with Russia. Given the fact that there are 130,000 Russian troops on Ukraine's border and we're talking about a full-scale invasion, it's quite possible that doing something short of that, like recognizing and maybe annexing Donetsk and Lugansk, would look like a kind of reasonable soft option, right? A year ago, that would have looked like an, a kind of uh, dramatic escalation on Russia's part. But now, given um, the, the real escalation we've seen, you know, that would almost look like um, an off-ramp that could be celebrated in some way in the West. I mean, I don't think the West would celebrate the annexation or the recognition of those territories, but we could sort of celebrate the fact that we avoided war, if indeed that was the case. Um, and for something like that, I don't think you would see the cancellation or sanctioning of Nord Stream 2 were Russia to recognize Donetsk and Lugansk. Um, now you can start trying to find various points on the escalation spectrum uh, all the way up to a full invasion with tanks coming across the border. In that case, I do think Nord Stream 2 is dead. Um, and I don't think it's dead in the case of recognition of Don, Donetsk and Lugansk, but you know, there's a lot of scenarios in between. Um, and sort of where, what's like the threshold um, that Russia can come right up against and not see the sort of sanctions that would cancel Nord Stream 2? I mean, that's, that's the high stakes game that, that Russia's playing. And again, that's going back to my point about Putin not always being this master tactician, it's really possible he could overplay his hand. He could misjudge. He could think he could um, embark on the sort of <clears throat> escalation that would be um, essentially tolerated by the West because thank God we avoided war, but, but misjudge and, and in fact, um, you know, cross some sort of line um, for the West. But, but I think that's what Putin is essentially now trying to do, calibrate his own move so as to what's the maximum he can get away with without actually triggering a massive um, Western response. Thank you. Um, so another question, you mentioned that life seems to be going on as normal in Ukraine. Um, this guest is particularly wondering about the possibility of a post-invasion, should it happen, insurgency. Uh, while the manifestly interminable insurgency in Iraq and Afghanistan caused the US military to eventually lose its mind and give up, Iraqi and Afghan populations, both insurgents and non-insurgents, paid an appalling cost for that result. Do you have any sense of Ukraine's pop, of 
um, the Ukrainian population's preparedness to accept the cost of insurgency. Are you aware of any steps being taken to lay the groundwork for such uh, a post-occupation insurgency? Well, I think it's definitely too early to talk about something like a post-occupation insurgency. I actually don't think, I mean, I, I hate to play this sort of guessing game. I should have said this actually is my first sentence of my whole presentation and that this, this topic more than any, really, I'm, I'm wary to say, you know, it's going to be like this or it's going to be like that. I really don't know. All scenarios are, are possible. I do think it's less likely that even if Russia were to invade, right, so we've already kind of, um, you know, in the realm of one scenario that I don't necessarily think is the is the, the kind of um, most likely one, which is like full scale, you know, sort of land invasion. Um, but even in that scenario, I don't think that Russia stays long enough for a protracted occupation. I think Russia knows full well that, um, you know, the, the, the cost of that occupation, um, both in terms of, you know, international kind of image, I mean, just every day that Russia, you know, has Ukraine under military occupation, I mean, just the, the degree of kind of um, sanctions and a program. I mean, the, the, the cost of that diplomatically, economically would just be extraordinary, not to mention um, its troops in its forces in Ukraine would face you know, daily threat of the kind of insurgency you, you mentioned. And for, for all that reason, for all those reasons and more, I just don't think that even if Russia were to um, invade in the way we're talking about, that it would stick around all that long um, for an insurgency to, to form. That said, you know, you see certainly reports of these territorial defense units cropping up all over the country. You know, these are essentially paramilitary organizations in which quote unquote ordinary people um, join up to receive a modicum of military uh, training um, and, and their numbers are, are indeed impressive. You know, the way that a modern military like Russia wages war, one has to wonder, you know, how effective would these units be. Um, it's quite possible that were Russia to indeed embark on a you know, large scale military intervention, it might be through things like, you know, cruise missiles, um, uh, and bombs, missiles launched from um, aircraft. In other words, like these, however, sort of brave and um, well-intentioned um, fighters, whether in the Ukrainian military or in these pale military groups on the ground would be, there's, there's sort of nothing on a technological level that they could do to counteract you know, those types of armaments. So um, I just don't know how central that element is to this to the sort of military equation. Um, it, it could be among the factors that keeps Russia from thinking about something like an actual sustained you know, occupation of large swaths of Ukrainian territory, but I just don't know how likely that was even without this factor. Thank you. Um... A follow-up to um, a question earlier. So why should we let Ukrainian politicians determine the U.S. level of risk, accept risk acceptance and the shape of U.S.-Russian relations more broadly? My proposed neutralization does not hinge on Ukrainian parliamentary acceptance. It would have to be imposed from without. Neutralization would logically rule out NATO membership. Uh, in other words, I think what that question is suggesting is, you know, the U.S., um, saying, for example, that it would not vote uh, for Ukraine joining NATO um, in the near future or having NATO issue some sort of declaration that would, uh, by necessity, kind of uh, negate or, or sort of withdraw the statement from 2008 when NATO um, said that it was, in fact, um, or I forget the exact formulation, but that, that, that Ukraine and Georgia will become NATO members. It didn't give a timeline, but it was pretty definitive about the fact that that will happen. However, one thinks about that declaration and thinks it was maybe kind of foolish, um, uh, rushed, whatever, like that was an official, that is now an official NATO document um, that needs to be addressed in some way. So like NATO has to officially withdraw um, that statement or the United States has to come out and say, you know, we will not vote for NATO. Um, for, for Ukraine joining NATO. You know, it's not for me to judge are those good or bad solutions to the, you know, conflict. The, the, one of the pleasures of journalism is, is sort of not engaging in um, policy formulation, but rather just trying to do my best to sort of explain um, events as I see them. So it's, I, I, don't, I don't really have an answer as to like, is that a good uh, policy um, or not? But it seems like the position of the United States is that we are not going to make sort of declarations about who or who cannot join 
um, a military alliance, you know, under the threat, under the barrel of a gun, as it were. Um, NATO has an open door policy, and we're not going to start to edit that open door policy um, because Russia says so. Again, we, we can debate like the merits of that position, and you know, with tens of thousands of Ukrainian lives on the line, why don't we just say Ukraine can't join NATO? That's a debate to have. It's an interesting question, right? But so far, the indications are that the Biden administration and NATO itself uh, doesn't want to be drawn into that sort of position in which it is kind of refuting its own charter based off of escalatory moves uh, by Russia. Great, thank you. Um, one last question. Um, and if anyone else has questions, please um, try to get them in in the next couple of minutes. That would be great. Uh, does Vladimir Putin uh, genuinely believe that Ukraine is not a separate nation from Russia, as he has argued in his article on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians? Uh, hard for me to say, you know, what really is in Putin's heart of heart. There certainly is something convenient and instrumentalized about those arguments. I think that he, um, you know, perhaps first and foremost, sees Ukraine through a security lens, and therefore it's convenient to then um, kind of adjust, if not create these histories you tell yourself on a cultural or historical level, um, so as to justify the, the needs um, as you see them, uh, the security interests as you um, see them. But, but I think, you know, we should listen to Putin. I don't mean like we should listen to him and that, you know, do what he says, um, or, or even, you know, believe that what he's saying is objectively true. But when he talks about his own beliefs and his own intentions, I actually think that Putin is, is kind of straightforward. However, sort of strange that that sounds. Um, um, when, when Putin is talking about what he perceives as Russian interests or what he perceives as a threat to Russian interests, I think that he's telling you the truth as he himself sees it. In other words, I don't think there's a lot of, I don't think he's trying to um, manipulate the reader or listener in terms of his own beliefs. So when we're talking about something like this um, historical essay, really refuting the idea of independent Ukrainian statehood, I think, or sort of nationhood, I think we should take him at his word. I think he, he means that. I think his conception um, of Ukraine is of a nation that is in some way, if not inherently subservient uh, to Russia and should be subservient to Russian interest, but that is this obvious inexorable part of greater Russian civilization and attempts to split Ukraine from this greater Russian civilization are not even so much inherent uh, to Ukraine. I think he doesn't believe that it's Ukrainians doing this. I think here is maybe an awkward analogy, but it's like with Navalny, you know, he thinks that it's ultimately um, these nefarious anti-Russian forces in the West that are pulling the strings, right? Just like I believe he thinks Navalny is not um, kind of an individual homegrown threat, but some kind of vassal representative of Western powers that seek to do Russia harm, or at least Putin harm. Same thing with um, Ukraine, that, this, I, that these attempts um, to separate Ukraine, you know, by Ukrainians from Russian civilization, and certainly from kind of the modern Russian political apparatus, that that's all really a, a Western plot, because deep down, um, the Ukrainian people and the Russian people are this sort of brotherhood, uh, are in, 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 this, in this brotherhood, uh, with Ukraine being part of greater Russian civilization. I think that's all uh, truly felt uh, for Putin. And again, it's convenient for him to come up with these cultural historical theories because they make his security imperatives um, all that much more grounded. Thank you. Um, let's see, I just saw a question pop in. Uh, how much political decisional latitude does Putin have regarding Ukraine? He is often portrayed as being in the middle of the spectrum between status quo versus radical Russian nationalist imperialist revisionist of the post-Soviet space. In sum, can any Moscow government acquiesce to the loss of Minsk and Kiev from Russia's sphere of influence and stay in power? Um. I, that's, I don't know. Um, I, is, I want to be uh, sort of as honest as I can about that, right? I think that we'd have to see, there'd be so much political change that would go along with that. By the time we got to a different political regime that was kind of willing to let um, Minsk, uh, to let Belarus and, and, and Ukraine go from Russia's sphere of influence, that would have meant there'd been such a fundamental change in Russian politics to get to that point that it's hard to predict 
hard to know kind of what Russian society would or uh, accept or, or, or not accept. Um, on the, what I feel more confident in answering is the immediate question and can Putin back down from this crisis, right? Does, does he need to show something domestically um, having escalated things so much and having made such a big, big deal about this um, and, and having Russian state television and other Russian officials make such a big deal about this. Does he, if he comes home empty handed, if he calls off the troops and comes home empty handed, is that humiliating? And I actually think the answer is, is no. Um, you know, no one really in Russia was asking for this sort of escalation. There, there was no domestic imperative or need for this escalation and, and talk of war with Ukraine. And the way it's been sold on Russian television, and um, I mentioned some of this polling data um, earlier, that most Russians view the current crisis as the West's fault, um, as NATO's fault, um, as the US's fault, that Russia is not to blame, but rather it's these aggressive escalatory moves by the West. And therefore, um, it would be quite easy for Putin to, uh, as we might call it, right, back down, bring home the troops, present some of these piecemeal uh, moves on diplomatic negotiations as victories, this Lukyanov position that, look, we're talking about things that the West refused to talk about for 20 years. Um, and no one is all that upset about it. Or no one is all that bothered about it because the West caused the escalation. Putin didn't fall for the trap. Putin, you know, didn't let Russia get sucked into a war that NATO was, um, you know, trying to provoke um, Russia into. He extracted some concessions and everyone goes home, you know, happy. I mean, that's a kind of, uh, you know, best case in a way scenario outcome for, for all of us. Um, but I, I can't, it's not out of the realm um, of, of possibility. You know, there, there isn't this expectation in Russia that like Putin ha either has to invade Ukraine or completely undo the European security architecture. We're talking about the attitudes of kind of Russians across the country. People are either not paying attention or uh, paying attention and assuming that this is all the West's fault. And that actually gives Putin, I think, a free hand to himself uh, de-escalate. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. So Josh, I just want to thank you again for giving this, this wonderful update. How apropos that you're actually in mm -hmm. versus Moscow this one time. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This is the first lecture of 16 that we have lined up. So next week we'll have Trisha Starks from the University of Arkansas talking to us about Soviets and cigarettes. So um, I look forward to seeing you guys joining us next week. And Josh, once again, thank you. Appreciate it.